Welcome to Law You Should Know. The law affects every aspect of our lives, our home, our jobs, and our recreational activities. Now you can learn about the law and how to protect yourself against the loss of your liberty or property. Learn how to stand up for your rights and seek compensation when you have been wronged. Your host for Law You Should Know is attorney Kenneth J. Landau with the Mineola Law Firm of Shane Dox Denise and Corker. He's a member of the Committee on Professional Ethics of the Bar Association of Nassau County and counsel to the Nassau Academy of Law. And now, here is your host for Law You Should Know, Attorney Kenneth J. Landau. Hi, this is Ken Landau, and welcome to Law You Should Know. Today we have a special program, What's New in the Law Schools, and our special guest is Karen Sloan. She's the a reporter for the National Law Journal and the New York Law Journal, and she covers uh, education issues and law school education. Karen, welcome to Law You Should Know. Thanks for having me, Ken. As we talk about what's new in the law schools, what is, how are admissions, applications to law school going in terms of trends? Sure. So enrollment in law school really is the big story in legal education right now. Enrollment, uh, law school just isn't as popular as it used to be. Um, they hit a kind of a high mark in enrollment in 2010, and ever since then, uh, each year they're enrolling fewer and fewer students. So overall, um, first year enrollment in law school down 29% over the past six years. So that's a big drop. So if someone's really interested in a legal career as a first or second career, they stand a chance of getting into a law school somewhere? Yeah, I mean, these days, your odds have never been better than landing a seat in law school because fewer people are applying. Schools are taking students who um, five, six years ago wouldn't have made the cut. So even if you don't have really high LSAT scores right now or a really high undergraduate GPA, you're going to get a second look from schools that maybe you wouldn't have before. And. Are there some schools that have even waived the LSAT requirement and are looking at other criteria? Well, that's a sticky subject. As it stands right now, rules from the ABA require law schools to use the LSAT as part of the admissions process. Law schools are supposed to look at the LSAT, but also your undergraduate GPA and, you know, other factors, extracurriculars, that kind of thing. Um, now, there are a few schools who are breaking away from that and are are – currently accepting GRE scores or have said they will accept GRE scores in the future, Harvard Law School being a very notable one. Um, but those are really small pilots. Um, there's only a couple of schools who are doing that. So right now, the LSAT still remains the major way to get into law school. And is there a trend where students are no longer going to right to law school after completing an undergraduate degree, that they're working or gaining some experience in a legal or business setting? Yeah. we Of course, you always have some students who didn't go directly into law school. But what I'm hearing from admissions officials more and more these days is that they're actually looking for students who have you know, a year, a few years more than that of work experience. And they have some interesting reasons why. One thing is that legal employers like to see work experience um, beyond just being in school. They like to see that people know how to work on teams. They know how to interact with clients. Uh, law schools think that having students with work experience in different back backgrounds actually makes for a more interesting classroom environment and more interesting discussions. And what I've heard from some admissions officials is that students who have a uh, some work experience, have a better sense of what they actually want to do with their law degrees. So there's some real ad advantages to having some professional experience under your belt before you show up to law school. And once students, let's say they're accepted and they arrive at law school, has the first year law student experience changed in recent years? Well, that's a tough one to answer, yes and no. Um, the 1L year still is the most rigid of the three years you have in law school. So that's when you get kind of the core curriculum of the classes that you've heard most often about. And these are the required classes, constitutional law, torts, contracts, that type of thing. 
But some schools, and quite a few schools actually, are now experimenting with supplementing some of those traditional core courses with some more interesting things. Some of them are starting to do some professional development in the very first year to help students figure out, okay, what is it I actually want to do with my law degree? What is the role of a lawyer in society? Um, some schools are experimenting with like mini courses um, on uh, business acumen, how to read a balance sheet things that you would need to know if you were advising a corporate client. So there is some experimentation in the first year, but um, like I said, the first year is still the most rigid in terms of the classes that you need to take. And is there more support offered today for the law students by many of the law schools in terms of, uh, let's say, extra help or bringing their writing or study skills up to par? Yeah, there definitely is. I think there is sort of the image. I don't know if you remember the movie, the the paper chase. There's the image of law school as being, you know, like professors terrorizing their students with, you know, cold calling them and trying to humiliate them. And so law schools still have this reputation as kind of a stressful, pressure cooker, scary kind of place. And for sure, there are still elements of that in law school. The Socratic method, which is also another way to say just cold calling students in class to make sure they've read the material and, and grill them, that still happens. But it is a kinder, gentler experience than what you would have seen 30, 20, even 10 years ago. Um, a lot of, uh, I mean, there's been some criticism of legal education in terms of putting too much pressure and an emotional toll on students. You know, uh, studies have shown they have a high rate of um, alcohol abuse and depression. And some administrators are really taking that to heart and they are adding things like on-site counselors so students who are feeling despondent or, or in depression or having some sort of an issue have people that they can go to. And they're trying to create more supportive environments, things like bringing therapy dogs. This is a popular one. Therapy dogs or therapy animals onto campus during exams when students are really stressed out. So they'll bring in some cute puppies and, and the students can pet them and, and try to just chill out a little bit. So you're, you are seeing efforts to make the whole environment a little more um you know, inclusive and less stressful. And, of course, today with new subjects uh, making their way into the law school curriculum, they might be offering courses in animal law or dog law as well. <laughs> sure. I mean, there is there is an endless – ne- I'm always – I am never cease to be amazed at some of the upper-level courses and, and electives and how specific and – and interesting and um, kind of far out there some of them are. So you're probably right. There's probably a dog law course somewhere. And and what are some of the more interesting upper-level courses that students might be able to take at some law schools? Well, gosh, I mean, like I said, they really run the gamut. But one thing that I think is interesting is that I'm seeing more of a push for um, schools to offer courses that are tied to current events. So, for example, right now, um, last semester and in the coming semester, some schools offered classes specifically tied to Donald Trump. And these classes were looking at sort of the executive powers, the limits of executive powers, and they were using events that were unfolding in real time, like the Muslim travel ban, or, you know, I'm sure, you know, the semester's over for most classes, but they would have a field day with the... Um, firing of um, FBI Director Comey. I mean, um, and students apparently are, are really, really interested and, and engaged when they have a class that is following events that they're following in the news and feel relevant and and up to date. And we also probably have a greater globalization of, of commerce and industry and laws, uh, you know, f- and regulations follow that as well. So many schools are probably expanding their course offerings to f- to cover that. Sure, international law, a big growth area. So, you know, I've talked to professors who lead courses that are specific to doing business in Latin America or in China. And, you know, they talk about the different ways the courts function in those jurisdictions and how the, you know, laws from different countries interplay when you have a legal matter that crosses borders. So there's definitely interest in in those classes. And I think students are interested in classes that they think are going to be relevant to whatever career they want to have. 
And they know that international law is a growing area, so they want to position themselves to to get the jobs that are going to deal with that. And is the ability to speak a foreign language uh, help a student get into law school or help them with their legal career? You know, this is an area I know a little bit less about, but I have heard some schools actually have programs specifically for Spanish speaking attorneys. So these are students who attorneys, students who who are Spanish speakers. And it, these classes help them brush up on um, sort of the legal legalese in Spanish. You may speak Spanish, but you don't necessarily know how to communicate complex legal concepts to to clients who are Spanish speaking, or um, you know how to relate to Spanish speaking clients. So I can only I don't know from the admissions front, but I know from the legal hiring front that having you know having Chinese language or um, Spanish is a is a is an advantage in terms of getting a law firm job. And also, in the past few years, have many more foreign attorneys come to the United States to take a master's program or perhaps a, a JD, so they can perhaps work or, or get a license to practice law somewhere in the U.S. Yes, that is a, a, the one growth area in law school enrollment right now. And um, LLM programs, which are master's degree programs, one-year master's degree programs for um, attorneys who are licensed in other countries, they come to the U.S., they spend a year at a U.S. law school, and after that they are um, entitled to sit for the New York bar exam. Now, most of them go back to their home countries. They see this as a credential that they can take back to, you know, burnish their re resumes back home. But it's the the growth is, is has come at a good time for law schools because all of a sudden they find themselves with empty seats. U.S. students aren't um, as interested as going in going to law school right now, so they have empty capacity. They can have these foreign attorneys come, and the foreign attorneys typically pay full tuition, unlike most of the U.S. students. So it's really become an important revenue generator to have these overseas attorneys come spend a year getting their LLM, and then returning. And in terms of, of, of earning credentials in law school and getting a valuable law, law school experience, are students more and more involved in, in clinical programs? Sure. Practical training, experiential training is a big focus of, in legal education right now. Um, you know, law schools are kind of moving away from the all-lecture format. I mean, there's still a lot of lecture courses. But the American Bar Association last year added a requirement that students have to complete six credits of experiential learning. So that means a, cr a clinic would count, an externship working in, you know, as a basically an intern at a, a law firm or another legal organization counts, simulation courses where professors, um, you know, students stand in as an attorney and they work with simulated clients, perhaps on a simulated business negotiation or something along those lines, that counts. And this is something students really want. I think they understand that employers are looking for as much practical experience as they can get from new hires. And, um, you know, working in a clinic or having an externship on your resume can make you stand out from the crowd. So in addition to the pressures coming down from the ABA as a regulator, students also want it. And also, if you're working in a clinic, you may be helping someone who can't afford an attorney. So you're helping, you're performing pro bono work and helping them with their legal problems as well. Sure, that's true. Lots of clinics um, do have a, a, pro, a pro bono angle. I mean, of course, you could also have policy clinics and clinics doing all sorts of other things. But there is a very important sort of pro bono aspect to it. And. It is important to, for a student to also try to work as an intern or summary associate to have a better chance of getting a job after law school? Definitely, definitely. The, tr the traditional trajectory uh, is that after you finish your first year, you know, lots of students will do something public service or public interest oriented, you know, volunteer for a, uh, you know, legal services, legal aid type group, or some other volunteer um, or public interest uh, job for that summer. And then the summer after your second year, traditionally, you may be a clerk at a law firm or work in some more um, 
you know, in any sort of a law firm environment. And then after, of course, after your third year, then you would be graduated taking the bar and hopefully landing yourself a, a full-time job. Okay, we have to take a short break now. We're talking with Karen Sloan. She's a reporter for the National Law Journal and the New York Law Journal covering legal education issues. And we're talking about what's new in the law schools. You're listening to Law You Should Know here on 90.3 WHPC the voice of NASS Community College, and also over the Internet at ncc.edu slash whpc. We'll be back in a moment. This portion of programming on WHPC is brought to you on behalf of the Nassau County Bar Association, who wants you to know about ADR, Alternate Dispute Resolution, which can help you avoid costly, lengthy, and uncertain litigation in court. By resolving disputes through mediation or arbitration, it gives you control over who decides your case. A mediator helps all parties to reach an agreement they can live with, or an arbitrator selected by the parties hears and decides the case. Your attorney can still represent you, but you control who decides your case. ADR is faster and less stressful than fighting in court, and it is a great way to resolve divorce, employment, or commercial disputes. ADR is now offered through the Nassau County Bar Association. Find out more about how ADR can help resolve your dispute by calling 516-747-4070 or visit nassaubar.org. Once again, we continue with Law You Should Know. From the Mineola Law Firm of Shane, Docks, Denise, Corker, and Sauer, here is attorney Kenneth J. Landau. Hi, this is Ken Landau, and welcome back to Law You Should Know. We're talking about what's new in the law schools, and our guest is Karen Sloan. She's a reporter for the National Law Journal and also the New York Law Journal, covering legal education issues. Karen, in the first part of the program, you were telling us about many of the varied courses and clinics available in the law school, traditional activities that can give a student a very good credential, perhaps to potential employers, like moot court and law review. Are they still popular and all important? Law review, definitely. Um, moot court, I think moot court and other extracurriculars to a lesser degree. Law, de- uh, law review still is kind of the gold standard for identifying who is at the top of the class. And in terms of like large firms, you know, the ones that pay the really high salaries, um, you know, being on law review can, can really make your resume stand out to them. And what are some other things that a lawsuit can do to stand out? If they, let's say they're not on law review. Sure. I mean, uh, class rank is a big deal to at least big law employers. So getting good grades should be the primary focus of, of any law student. But also um, tailoring your law school experience to the kind of job that you want. And if you want to go work for the ACLU or you want to go work for, um, you know, a white shoe law firm, those are two very different tracks. So I think you need to identify where it is you want to end up and think about how to structure your law school experience so that you're positioning yourself for that job. So let's say you want to go work for the ACLU. Yes, by all means, take clinics, spend your summers working for public interest organizations, demonstrate that you have a commitment to serving the public and that you've done everything you can to pursue that track up to this point. And aside, and I'm sorry, aside from the classroom, you also, starting on day one in law school, you want to try to make connections, develop contacts, and, and do networking. Absolutely. Now, you know, you cannot overstate the importance of, of networking in really in any industry, but especially the legal industry. And it really starts on day one, not when you're a month away from graduation. Absolutely. And I think what you'll find is career services offices um, at, at law schools are really trying to emphasize that to to students really early in their careers. Don't wait until the third year to figure out what you want to do. Really start exploring your aspirations from day one and put yourself on that path. And in terms for alternate careers or non-traditional careers for law students or, or lawyers, have there been has that field changed in recent years? I mean, I honestly feel like you could find anybody, you could find a former attorney in in every single industry, you know, from, you know, the guy running the food truck to who knows. <laughs> I mean, there really are, it almost seems endless. You'll find former attorneys everywhere. But there are a few areas where I think are um, kind of hot growth areas for people who have a law degree but don't necessarily want to practice. So one is in corporate compliance. Um, 
there are so many, you know, regulations out there that corporations have to follow. And a lot of companies are more comfortable having trained lawyers handling that. I mean, and it's not just corporations. I mean, I've talked to um, attorneys who work in athletic departments at colleges who are in charge of making sure they comply with all the NCAA regulations. I mean, there really is just a, a ton of compliance opportunities out there, and lawyers are well positioned for those. Um, I mean, HR, that's kind of an area where sometimes um, companies like to have lawyers um, involved. And then there's, there's this whole other industry that's kind of legal services and all these kind of um, – sort of tech startups and and different programs that are designed to help lawyers do their jobs. And you find a ton of trained lawyers in, you know, working in in e-discovery and and software platforms that help lawyers, but they're not actually practicing. And let's go back to day one. If someone asked you if law is a good field to go into, what would you tell them or how would you tell them to think about it? I I mean, I would, I might, my, sort of first piece of advice would be to sit down and really think about um, what lawyers do, figure out what lawyers do, and figure out if, if that's what you want to do. Because, you know, sitting back and watching Law and & Order is not a good reason to go to law school. You know, you like what you see on the TV, and, and I want to do that. Well, you know, there's a ton of lawyers who never set foot in a courtroom. Um, and you and mentioned so you depression. To, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I said you just need to, you know, I would talk to lawyers and I would really get a sense of what all types of, what what a day is like for a lawyer before I decided to do that. And not all lawyers are happy campers, so it's important to do your due diligence before you spend the time and money. Sure, even before you start applying, I think you have to do some real soul searching to figure out, okay, what is it that lawyers do and is that what I want? And what kind of setting would you want to do? What about in terms of law school debt? You know, there are different options for law school, some hype, just like they're off of college or other uh, advanced education programs, what would you suggest for people in evaluating the debt issue? Well, I mean, cost is one of those things that I would say absolutely before you ever apply, before you ever take the LSAT, sit down and look at how much it actually costs to go to law school. I mean, it's an expensive proposition. Um, I think the latest numbers that we have from the ABA are from 2014, but they said that if you go to a public school, you know, on average, you'll graduate with $84,000 in educational debt. And if you go to a private school, it's like 122. But it's not uncommon to see people with $200,000 of law school debt. So first, you need to um, know what you're getting into. But the other thing you need to know is that because fewer people are going to law school right now, schools are really competitive about bringing admittance in, which means that you have more leverage to get scholarships from those schools. Or so, some kind of partial scholarship. Uh, I mean, you might get it, depending, you know, if you have an I, high LSAT and good grades, you could get a full ride scholarship. That's not unheard of. But what I would say is if you have offers from multiple law schools, negotiate those scholarships. Because, you know, I'm hearing a lot about admissions offices, you know, offering more money after the fact when somebody comes to them and says, well, this school is offering me this. Can you match it or can you beat it? And aside from the financial package, what else would you think, what else should people do in deciding which law school to attend? You know, I would say don't just look at the U.S. News Law School rankings. You should look at the U.S. News Law School rankings, but that should not be the only factor that you consider. Um, I would look at what's, what each school costs. I would look at their job statistics. There's a couple of websites out there that have really detailed information about the kind of jobs that graduates get every year. Law schools have to report to the American Bar Association how many of their graduates went into certain types of jobs. So if you know what kind of a job you want, you can go through all these statistics and you you can look and see and you can say, okay, hey, Columbia sends a ton of students to those big fancy law firm jobs. Or, um, you know, Hofstra is sending a lot of students into being solo practitioners, and I really want to be a solo practitioner. It only makes sense to zero in on the schools that are producing the kind of graduate that you want to be. And I guess it doesn't hurt to speak to students if you go look at the schools, what they like about it, and what they think their career prospects are? Absolutely. Talk to the students, talk to the faculty, tour the campuses, 
look at the job statistics, look at the costs. I mean, there's a lot of factors to take into consideration. We just have a few minutes left in the program. Are there some websites that could be helpful to people considering law school or law, who are law students now? Yeah, there's a couple I would recommend. The American Bar Association actually maintains a, a really detailed website. Um, it's abarequireddisclosures.org, I believe. And you can pull up any law school that you're interested in, and you can see what their tuition is. You can see what LSAT, LSAT scores their enrolled students earn, what kind of grades their, the students that they're enrolling earn since they're undergraduate grades. You can see their bar pass stats. That's a really important one. You want to go to a school that's getting a lot of students through the bar. They also have detailed information about jobs, you know, what percentage of graduates are getting jobs and what kind of jobs. There are. I would also recommend going to a, an organization called Law School Transparency. They have a really great website that has all this comparative data about student debt and jobs. And, you know, you can look at, at the schools individually to evaluate them. And we just have a moment left. Do you have any final thoughts or suggestions on uh, going to law school in the 21st century? I mean, I think it can be a really great decision, but it's not the best decision for everybody. I think people just need to be um, really critical about whether or not it's the right thing to do, because three years of your life and $100,000 later, you know, you can't be casual about it. The days of, oh, well, I don't know what I want to do. I have an English degree and no job, so I'll go to law school. I mean, those days have passed. The stakes are just too high and the costs are too high. So I would say just be really... Um, you know, just be really thoughtful about whether or not it's the right decision. And in 20 seconds, are there any good majors for a college student who's thinking of going to law school someday? You know, I would say the growth area is get a STEM degree. Law schools and legal employers are just falling all over themselves to enroll and to hire people who have those science, technology, and math backgrounds. It's a huge growth area. And part depends what area of law you're thinking of going into as well. Sure. I mean, obviously, patents and intellectual properties is, is the big one. But, you know, biotechnology, there's just all, it's, it's a real growth area. Okay. I wish we had some more time, but I would like to thank Karen Sloan for being our guest on Law You Should Know, discussing what's new in the law schools. And, of course, you can read her articles in the National Law Journal and the New York Law Journal. You're listening to Law You Should Know here on 90.3 WHPC in Garden City, Long Island, New York, and also over the Internet at ncc.edu slash WHPC. And you can find podcasts of this program by searching WHPC on iTunes. Please join us.